Good morning. We're so glad to have you join us for church, whether you're watching online or with us in person. I'm Alex Krautwurst, the elementary pastor here at Canyon Hills, and I have a passion to make more and better disciples of the next generation through discipling kids and equipping parents and volunteers to do the same. Before we get started, I wanna share with you the plan for Christmas. After much prayer and thoughtful consideration, we have decided to have our Christmas Eve service online. Even though it'll be a little bit different than the past, we have a special service plan for your entire family, and we are so excited to celebrate the birth of our Savior with you. You can find more details by visiting www.christmasatcanyonhills.com. And as always, if you're looking to join a life group, would like to submit a prayer request, or wanna learn more about what we believe, you can visit our website or download the Canyon Hills app. Well, that's all I have for you today. It really is a joy to worship with all of you. Now let's praise our wonderful and faithful God together. Well, good morning, Canyon Hills. We are so glad that you decided to join us today. And this week I've just been so thankful that we have a God that does not leave us hopeless in our sin. He does not leave us hanging. When we needed saving, Jesus did not hesitate to come down and rescue us. And when his work on earth was finished, he ascended up to heaven and left us with the gift of the Holy Spirit that would help us and convict us and comfort us. And to me, that just is a good reminder that our God is intentional and he is purposeful. He is faithful in his promises. He is um, sovereign in his plan and he is with us here today. He does not forsake his children and that is worth celebrating. So I'm gonna invite you to get to your seat and we are gonna worship our God with all that we have today. He is worthy of our praise. He is here in this room and he is fighting for us. So let's sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
together in one voice. Let's sing this out. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And until that day, until we look forward to that day, we're not going to wait for that day to praise your name, to lift you high. Lord, for you are worthy and worthy to be praised, sitting on your throne. And even now, even today, we join the heaven song, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. this room, can you sing this out with me, these familiar words? Holy, holy are you Lord God Almighty Worthy is the Lamb Worthy is the Lamb Again You are holy this up.
what we're talking about. Oh, what a wonderful day to come When every knee bows before your name But we will not wait that day comes, we will not stop singing your praises. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this time of worship. It's in your awesome and holy name we pray. Amen. I believe that was God-pleasing worship, as we did what only God deserves, and that is to adore him and exalt him and praise his name. He's the only one worthy of that from us. Amen? Amen. Well, in just a minute, we're going to open God's Word together as we always do every Sunday, but this is the first Sunday of December, and it's this Sunday every single year that we take a few moments just to look back over the year and highlight some of the good things God has done in us and through us as a church. It's always good to count your blessings and remember the faithfulness of God to us and through us, and so we're going to do that today just for a few minutes. We do this every year this time. 
And it's also, the emphasis of this is really the stewardship of our church and the responsibility God gives us with our tithes and offerings. Um, Three months ago, at the beginning of September, the process began to start planning for next year for the budget. And the trustees of the church, which are made up of five church members, uh, one pastor and one elder, they get together, they crunch the numbers, and they give the parameters for next year based on all the details that they look at to the pastors and ministry directors to come up with their budgets for next year within these parameters. Once they do that, they submit them back to the trustees, uh, and they go over it you know, line by line, make some suggestions, make a few corrections, and then once the trustees have it right where it needs to be, then they send it to the elders for their final approval. The elders go over it, uh, they look at it, and then when they're comfortable with it, they send it to the members of Canyon Hills Community Church. And if you're a member, uh, you should have received that budget in the mail probably a month ago. The next step is we have a Q&A meeting. This happened two Sundays ago for any member who just has questions, any question at all about anything to do with the budget. That meeting took place a couple of weeks ago, and now today we come to the final step. And if you're watching online, uh, this makes for riveting TV. I'm just promising you that right now. Uh, the final step will be in just a moment, but before then, um, one of our elders, Randy Tredovic, come on up, Randy. Randy is the vice chairman of the elders, and he is going to share with you the highlights and, and some of the things that pertain to as we look forward to next year. So Randy, Thanks. take a few Well, this morning, it's my privilege to bring to you the State of the Union Address on the condition of our church. This has been an unusual year. That was a gross understatement. You may be wondering, how has the coronavirus affected and impacted our church? Are we healthy? Are we strong? Are we going broke? When this is over, will anyone show up? In the gospel account, Jesus said this to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, neither will the coronavirus. God has been at work in and through our church this year. As Pastor Steve and I were talking about some of the things that have happened, it, I was amazed and excited, and I'm here to be able to share some of that with you this morning. So before I talk about the budget, I want to share a few highlights. Be prepared to be amazed and inspired. When was the last time you heard that at a budget meeting? But because of your generosity and faithfulness in obedience to God's call uh, this year, here are some of the amazing things that we've been able to do. We've invested $986,000 in global outreach, bringing the gospel to all the nations. We have 28 global partners that were fully funded. We, we also have five new family units that are preparing to launch and go into the world to spread the gospel of Christ. By the way, spontaneous applause is permissible and encouraged. <laughs> we have 185 functioning life groups. There were 20... Yes. 24 new groups were formed this year with 350 people. We have 2,100 people that are in a life group. $146,000 was given to our aid and assistance to help people in financial need, including single parents and widows. This is amazing. $250,000 was given to food in our food bank to feed the hungry. 278,000 pounds of food was given away. Just to put that in perspective, perspective, that's 100 tons of food. Think about that for a moment. We fed over 8,000 families. And just to give this a little context, last year at this time, we were feeding about 60 to 70 families a week. This year, 
200 to 300 families a week. That's four times more than last year at this time. But that's not all. We were able to give substantial gifts to three struggling churches in our area. We gave 25000 to each, uh, one of which uh, had their building burned down. And it was so uh, encouraging to us that as we were under some public scrutiny a few weeks ago, one of those, church, one of those pastors called and, <clears throat> and shared with Pastor Steve that they were praying for our church. Our counseling ministry has been able to continue on through Zoom meetings, and the Lord knows that there have been uh, great needs as people struggle with fear, anxiety, loss of job. We've been delivering meals to the widows in our church once a week. We've given gift cards to single parents. Our seniors have been contacted on a regular basis. And we're in the process right now of investing $35,000 in a, an air purification system for our church to continue every effort we can to keep, keep you safe when you come to church. Church, can we just pause for a moment and raise a hallelujah for the good things that God has done this year. Now let's talk about the budget for next year. Our budget this year was for $8 million. We anticipated spending $8 million. How much did we actually spend? Well, we spent a little bit less than that. We spent about $7.4 million this year. Uh, about $600,000 less in our budget. And the main reason for that was that there were certain things that we were unable to do this year, such as camps for the youth and the children and, and retreats. And this is amazing. This is the best part of my talk. How much did we receive last year? $10,655,000. In, in spite of being shut down for 90 days, and the last time we passed an offering plate in this building was March. You might be wondering, how does this compare to last year's giving? Surely it must be lower because of all of the financial distress. And this, this is just quite amazing, church. Our giving this year, year to date, compared to the same time last year, is 99% of what we gave last year. Now we have three weeks left in, in this year and, and uh, I wanna challenge all of us to put that number up over 100%. How amazing would that be if we gave more money this year under the pandemic than we did last year? Only God can do that. So, you're probably thinking in your head, we took in $10 million and we spent $7 million. We had a surplus of over $3.2 million this year. Now, what are we going to do with that money? As we have told you in the past, we have felt God's call on us to plant a, another campus somewhere. And we've tried. We've been looking and, and we've uh, set money aside. So we will continue to keep that money set aside for either the new campus somewhere else or other projects that God calls us to. And we have some in mind that we believe will, will broaden and deepen our ministries. Now, this is the time that we present next year's budget to you. And our budget for next year is $7,935,000. It's a little bit more than what we spent last year. It's about $500,000 more. Uh, and that mainly is due to the fact that we've, we've uh, built in some optimism in our budget that uh, we will be able to do some of the activities that we were prevented from doing this last year. And in just a second, Pastor Steve will come up and explain our next steps and how you can vote to approve this budget. Church, the state of our church is strong. Between the streaming views and our live attendees, we are reaching between five and 700 more people per week than we were last year at this time. <laughs> the, 
this would be a good time to thank Cairo News for the free publicity that they gave us a few weeks ago. We may never know how many people tuned into our church and heard a very clear presentation of the gospel by Pastor Steve, but the Lord knows. Our reach is broader and our ministry is deeper than ever before. Thank you for your generosity, your faithfulness, and your obedience to the call of Christ. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, to see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out on you such blessings that you will not be able to contain it. Truly, God has opened the windows of heaven and poured out his blessings on our church. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's pray. Father, we are <clears throat> humbled and so grateful this morning as we look back and see what you have done in and through us. God, we are so grateful that you give your grace lavishly. God, help us to be good stewards of what you've given us. God, as we continue to endeavor to make more and better disciples, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, Randy. Okay, so the final step. This is weird because obviously we haven't done this before this way, but the final step is that the, the members of the church who've completed the membership process, you received the budget, uh, you approve the budget. That's your responsibility to go over it, look at it, ask questions, make sure um, everything is what it needs to be. And now if you're a member, whether you're here in the building, you're over in the overflow rooms or you're at home, uh, we're going to approve the budget by texting in our approval. It's really personal, I know. Uh, but it's the best way to do that now because we're not passing anything down the aisles to collect anything. So if um, you approve of the budget, members, we want you to type the words vote yes to the number 56525. And if you do not approve the budget, you type the two words vote no to the same number. And once those votes are in, uh, we'll let you know of the, um, the final thing next Sunday. So vote yes or vote no, members, according to um, what you believe about the budget, and we will communicate with you next week. So that completes that, and as Randy has said, it's been a joy to rejoice in God's faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to him to do the things that we're doing in the midst of the craziness that we live in. Amen? Amen. All righty. Thank you. Let's get our Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 1. Book of Hebrews chapter 1. And today I want to begin getting our hearts and minds ready to try and enjoy Christmas this year, including today. Uh, there are three Sundays and then Christmas Eve. And today we're going to start with who Jesus is right now as the exalted one, culminating on Christmas Eve with his birth. So here's the flow. Today, we're going to talk about the exaltation of Jesus, where he is right now. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the resurrection of Jesus. The next Sunday, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to talk about the incarnation or the birth of Jesus. Now, notice we're going in reverse order here. And that's because the birth of Jesus will mean infinitely more to us when we understand the whole story, right? Right? the whole reason and purpose for why Jesus had to come and why he had to do what he had to do. And I'm thinking of these next three Sundays, kind of like when you go and see a movie and the movie starts, it opens with the end of the movie. And you don't realize it, but you're watching the end of the movie and then all of a sudden it flashes up on the screen three years earlier, right? You know those kind of movies? And it goes back to the beginning and it works its way back. That's kind of what we're doing. We're, we're, we're starting at the end of, of the story with Jesus' exaltation where he is now. And then when we come to Christmas Eve, it's gonna be like we're gonna flash up on the screen 33 years earlier, okay? So that's kind of what we're doing. We'll totally be confused after about the second week of this, but we'll try to stay on track. And I think by the time we get to Christmas Eve, our hearts are gonna be really prepared. So today we focus on his exaltation. Just days before Jesus was crucified and, and, and rose from the dead, he told his disciples these words in John 16. He said, the father himself 
loves you because you have loved me. And you believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world and now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. What Jesus told them is that he was returning to where he had come from that ultimately he wasn't from here. He wasn't just one of us in the purest way. Jesus wasn't going to heaven for, for the same reasons that a Christian goes to heaven after we die. You see, for us, when we die, we too will rise to live life eternal in the presence of God where Jesus is right now. But we needed to be forgiven. We needed to be redeemed first before we can go to heaven and be with God forever. When Jesus died and when he rose from the dead, he didn't need to be forgiven. He didn't, he didn't need any of that. He was exalted and returned to where he had come from, to his rightful place, that place he left in order to save us by his own blood. So with that set up, let's now stand for the reading of God's word in Hebrews chapter one, probably one of the, the best passages in the Bible when it talks about where Jesus is now. Long ago at many times, verse one, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. God in heaven with heads bowed, we just pray that you would honor, you would bless the reading and the preaching and the hearing of your word. And we pray, God, in the, in the presence of your Holy Spirit today that you would minister to our souls, that, God, you would bring comfort to those who are all around us right now, who are hurting, who are sad, who are struggling. God, I pray you would bring much grace and mercy to their life and circumstances today. And more than ever, that you would remind us, all of us, God, that you are real and that your son, Jesus Christ, is alive and he is seated at your very right hand. God, help us to know what that means for us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's be seated. I want you to notice before we jump all the way in, I want you to notice a few things before we get going. The Hebrew writer acknowledges here that there are two ways that God reveals the, his plan of redemption to fallen humanity. There are two ways God communicates to the world what he is doing or what he has done in this case. In verse one, you see that we're told that the way God communicated his plan was to speak through his prophets, his appointed prophets. Prophets. God communicated to humankind in the Old Testament before Christ he, through chosen men of God, anointed by God to speak on his behalf to his people. Men like Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, David, and others all throughout the Old Testament, God spoke to humanity. In verse 2, we see the second way in which God speaks to or reveals and communicates his plan of redemption with sin-broken humanity. And we're told here that he speaks through his son, by his son, Jesus Christ. And notice that the Hebrew writer describes the time of Jesus as the last days. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, last days. In other words, he is, Jesus is the final revelation of everything God wants you and me to know. The coming of Jesus is kind of the end of the sentence. It's the period at the end of God's sentence when it comes to the truth that he wants us to know concerning things like our forgiveness, like salvation, eternal judgment, wrath, heaven, and hell. Everything God wants us to know about all of those things has been brought to us and communicated to us through the life and ministry, the birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing is missing. Jesus said and did everything according, perfectly according to God's redemptive will. And the Hebrew writer here has one goal. He has one goal in these opening four verses, and that is to make absolutely sure that there is no mistaking on our, our part of who Jesus is, what 
he came to do and where he is now. That is his goal. He wants to make sure that none of us minimize and miss the point that this little baby we're going to be celebrating in the manger on, on Christmas Eve is much more than that. And that's where we start. We start with where he is now, who he is now. And so we see in verse 3 that Jesus has no equal. That is the point of verse 3 in a nutshell. After his resurrection and ascension, we read here that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This is the unequivocal main point of these verses. Jesus is alive and he is seated at the right hand of God, exactly where Jesus told his disciples that he was going, and not only his disciples, but to the Jewish council who put him on trial right before they handed him over to the Romans to kill on a cross. In Luke 22, we pick up that scene where it says, when day came, the chief priests and scribes led him away to their council, and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. In other words, if you are the Messiah, if you're the anointed one, if you're the one that was supposed to come from God and save us, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And so they all said, are you the Son of God then? Are you telling us you're the Messiah? Are you saying that you came from God? And he said to them, you say that I am. And then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. And then they turned him over to be killed. Now notice, as soon as Jesus said this to the council, as soon as he said, in just a while, from now on, I will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. As soon as he said that, they immediately asked him the question, so are you the son of God? They knew exactly what he meant. They knew that being seated at the right hand of the power of God meant something. It means that Jesus is of the highest, the divine highest rank and power in the universe. They knew exactly what he was claiming. They couldn't believe their ears. He was declaring to them right before they were going to kill him, I am of the highest rank and power and character in the universe. And that's what exaltation means, that there's no one above him. You see, in monarchies, typically, the seat at the right of any throne was reserved for only those who spoke and acted with equal authority and power as the one on the throne. Many thrones, you'll see pictures of this in history books too, many thrones have a seat on the right and the left. And the seat on the right of the throne indicated the one who, who could speak and act with equal power as the one who was actually on the throne. And so along with Jesus, the Hebrew writer is telling us that there is no one superior to Jesus, not even the angels. And even the apostle Paul understood this truth. In Philippians 2, he writes, God highly exalted him, giving him the name that is above every name and every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the Psalms, David prophesying of, the, of Jesus' coming exaltation, he prophesies in the Psalms that the Father said to Jesus, come, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And the point is that none of us, no one should ever dare to compare Jesus to anybody else. He is exalted to the highest place in the universe. He has no equal. We cannot compare him, not even to Abraham or Moses. We should never compare him to Buddha or Muhammad. We should never compare him to the popes or Joseph Smith, not even to his own mother, Mary. Dare we ever compare Jesus to any of them? Jesus has no equal. He is of the highest divine rank and power. And when he speaks and acts, it is directly from God himself. That is the Jesus who we just praised and worshiped this morning. But there's a second thought that's related to the exaltation of Jesus, and it would be this. He has the power to actually fulfill every single promise he ever made. We see this in verse 2. We read in verse 2 that he is the heir of all things. 
through whom he created the whole world. Everything in the universe, seen and unseen, belongs to and submits to Jesus. Everything. There's absolutely nothing that exists that he does not have authority over, including nature and life and death itself. When Jesus tells the wind and the waves to stop, when he tells the blind to see and the lame to walk and the dead to rise, they do. When Jesus promises to forgive our sins, to remove all of the guilt and shame and condemnation of those who believe in him, he can. And when Jesus promises to return again to judge and sentence to eternal damnation all who mock God the Father by rejecting God the Son, he will. He will keep his promises. The Hebrew writer leaves no doubt that Jesus owns and rules all things because God the Father created the whole world through God the Son, right there in the scriptures. Again, we turn to the Gospel of John where John writes in chapter one, he, talking about Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. These are staggering truths about Jesus that he owns all things and everything submits to him, enabling him to keep every promise he has ever made. He is eternally existent and co-creator with God and is seated at the right hand of majesty. And these truths are why we got out of bed today to come together to worship our mighty king. Amen? Amen. Amen. The exaltation of Jesus. Think about this. He holds the whole world together. We see in verse three that Jesus didn't just create the universe and then walk away so that natural selection and the survival of the fittest can run their course. Jesus didn't just create the world and then sit back and go, well, I hope that works out. No. Verse three literally literally reads like this, that he currently and continually upholds all things by the simple word of his power. He's holding together the existence of everything, including you and me. Now think about this. Let's go a little deeper here. There are really only two things that could keep you from going to heaven when you die. There are only two things that can keep anyone from going to heaven when they die. The first one is that if your sins are not forgiven and removed, because we know that sin and God cannot coexist. There can be no sin in the presence of God. So our sins have to be forgiven and removed. If yours aren't, you can't go to heaven. But there's another reason that's one maybe less obvious, but just as important for us to realize. The only other reason that you couldn't go to heaven is if you ceased to exist. And what I mean by this is that the secular worldview will tell us that death means non-existence. The world tells us constantly that when you die, you simply cease to exist. Whatever happens after this life doesn't matter. Now, you think about this for a moment. That worldview is really what's at the root of all hopelessness in our world. This worldview is where things like infanticide and genocide and abortion and homicide and sadly even suicide are justified in the minds of sinful man. And this is where all that is born out of. Think about it. The sanctity and value of your life, the worth and value of any human life becomes meaningless if in the end, all there is is non-existence. Then it doesn't matter. But a biblical worldview reminds us that without Jesus, it's impossible to know who you are And without Jesus, you cannot know why you are. You cannot know who you are in relationship to God, and you cannot know why you are, why he created you in the purpose and meaning for your life. Without Jesus, you have no access to that information because the world's messed it up and offers no hope and no answers to those questions. So when we read that Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power, it means that all things are working together for the good, for the joy and satisfaction of those who love God and are called according to his purpose and meaning. When it says that Jesus has the power 
to uphold everything in the universe. That means your very existence and everything that is happening in your life right now, he is using at work. It's not being wasted, ultimately bringing you to a place of joy and satisfaction because you love God and believe in him. It means that death has no power over his life-giving meaning, value, and worth to your life. This is why, listen to me now, this is why we face pandemics differently. This is why we can live a little bit differently in these days that we are living in. Faith changes everything for us. For the world who rejects the exalted Christ, death is the end. If you have a a secular worldview, death is the worst possible outcome. For us, death isn't the worst thing ever. No, 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 no. Death without Jesus is the worst thing ever, right? That's the worst thing ever. For us, Paul says, to live is for Jesus. But to die is what? Gain. Now, that's not some form of Christian fatalism. Not at all. This is the assurance that we have of things to come, the conviction of things we can't yet see. And in these days, this is exactly why faith in Jesus must matter to you. It has to matter to you. This life is not all there is. Amen? Amen. Forgetting that, forgetting this wonderful truth that this life isn't all there is, is exactly what defines sin-broken human beings. Forgetting this spells an unappeasable fear of death. And that's basically what's running our world right now. This uncomforted, unappeasable, hysterical fear of death. And if you hold to a secular worldview, death should. You should be afraid of death. You should be scared to death of death. Because the Bible warns it's appointed once for everyone to die and then to face the judgment. But for those who love and trust in the exalted Jesus, he preserves both our bodies and our souls, especially at the judgment. I love these words in 1 Corinthians 1. He will sustain you to the end. He will hold you together to the end, wherever and whenever that end is for you, and you will be guiltless. On the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On that day, when Jesus keeps his promise to return in order to judge the living and the dead, you will be sustained as perfectly guiltless because you have put your trust in the exalted one and he will keep you strong till that day. Jesus is alive and he can be known and he can be trusted and he can be loved And he is the only one in the universe deserving of our worship because he is seated at the right hand of the majesty, sustaining us both now and forevermore. That's the little Jesus that we're gonna celebrate in the manger in a few weeks, right? Here's another thing to do with the exaltation of Jesus. He saves us from all our sins. In verse three, it says, after he made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The writer is so fired up about this truth about Jesus making purification for our sins. He says the same exact thing again in chapter 10. This is the crowning moment of God's redemption plan. The crowning moment. Our sin is so grievous to God that he was willing to give his own son to die for our sins so that that God's coming wrath and anger against our sin could be appeased and averted so that we could be forgiven and our hearts cleansed from the death and darkness that sin has brought to our souls, the souls of mankind. And so sitting down in the place of highest exaltation at the right hand of God is is an honor. It's, it's, It's honoring Jesus. It's a declaration of how perfect and complete and sufficient his death in our place is to save all who put their their hope and trust in him. Now, that's all I'm going to say about this because in two Sundays, we're going to look at the meaning and purpose of the crucifixion in greater depth. So I want to move on to the final exaltation here in Hebrews. It's really the ultimate identifier of who Jesus is in 
verse three, and it would be this, Jesus is God visible for all to see. In verse three, we read, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. What does it mean to be the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of the nature of God? What in the world does that mean? Well, Jesus explains it in John 14 when he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, translation, Jesus is saying, if you, if, to see what God is like, you have to look at me. You have to see what I'm like. To know God, Jesus is saying, you have to know me. To reject or deny God the Son is to reject and deny God the Father. You cannot have the one without the other. And here's where we really have to think. We have to become almost like little theologians this morning. So let's take it one at a time. We read here in our Bibles that Jesus is the exact imprint of God's nature. You see that right there in verse three? Now, he's not talking like the way a picture represents a person. He's not talking about an inanimate object. The Hebrew writer is not saying that, that we can know Jesus if we just are familiar with a picture of Jesus. He's not saying that we can have a relationship with something that looks like Jesus but isn't Jesus. That's not what he's saying. You can't have a relationship with a photograph even if that photograph is of someone you deeply love. The photograph isn't the person. So we, we know he's not saying that, which some false teaching will say this means. That Jesus isn't really God, he's just kind of like God. He's a representative of God. No, it's deeper than that. I, I want you to think more in the terms of like a thumbprint. There's only one thumbprint that matches your thumb, right? We know that. No one else has your thumbprint. Your thumbprint, think about this, in essence is evidence of your existence. In court, your thumbprint says you were at the scene of the crime. Well, if God had thumbs, Jesus would be his thumbprint. God was at the scene of the crime. God was at the crucifixion. God himself was on the cross. Are you starting to feel the weight of that, of the exaltation of Jesus Christ? I know human illustrations always fall short. I don't even know if a thumbprint idea comes even close to what, what the, 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 the hugeness of this moment. And that's why we have to look at the rest of verse three because there are two statements here that have to go together. The other statement is this, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus precisely and exactly represents God God's nature, the way radiance represents glory. Now, what in the world does that mean? The best example I found this week in trying to prepare to figure out how to explain this stuff, the best example I have found comes from the analogy of the way sunlight relates to the sun. So think of a picture, a beautiful picture of a, of a sunrise or a sunset. When you look at that, at no time does the sun exist without beams of sunlight? The sun is always radiating light, always. The radiance of the sunlight cannot be separated from the glory of the sun. In other words, the sun and the sunlight are co-eternal. They are co-existent. You can't separate the two. And so when you relate that to Jesus, he is co-eternal with God, God the Father, and the one does not exist without the other. You cannot pull them apart and separate them. Now, now let me try this again because I still don't think I can figure this out enough to where you leave here without scratching your head. But let me, let me try it one more time. I want you to think about the holiness of God and the glory of God. These two phrases we're familiar with. When we talk about the holiness of God, what we're considering, what we're talking about is all of his moral perfection that is concealed, that is unseen, that is 
invisible, all of God's moral perfection. That is his holiness, but you can't see his holiness. When you talk about the glory of God, we're describing all of his perfection revealed and seen and visible. And so Jesus is the glory of God. All of the perfection of God is revealed and seen in Jesus. He makes God visible. It's kind of like when you look at a majestic mountain and and you see it, or maybe a a majestic ocean and you're standing on the ocean and you just think, gosh, when I look at that, I see the glory of God. What you're saying is that mountain or that ocean is revealing the power of God made visible. Jesus reveals all of God to us. Again, we turn to John chapter one and we read this, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And the word of God, that's Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. Like like beams of sunlight coming from the sun, Jesus, the light of the world comes from the father. He's the light that radiates from and reveals the glory of the Father, the glory of his perfect love, the glory of God's perfect holiness, perfect grace, perfect mercy, perfect justice, and perfect wrath, and of course, perfect power. Christmas is, so, is, is about so much more than just the nativity scene. The world is so consumed with all these distractions this time of year especially. And they are trying to make Christmas meaningful by all of the world's shallow and empty ways. But when we come to Christmas Eve, we're going to know who that baby is. We're going to know by then what he came to do. And we're going to know for sure based on today where he is right now. Amen? And I ask you, whether you're in this building or in one of our overflow rooms or you're at home listening, I I ask you, do you know this Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is only begun by a willingness to confess and admit that you are a sinner who needs to be forgiven and have all your guilt and shame removed, that that you are ready to put your faith and trust in what Jesus has done on the cross, talk about that next week, to die in your place, to take all the punishment that your sin is going to get if you do not receive God's gift of grace and forgiveness. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, then Christmas will never be more to you than a little plastic or blow-up nativity scene in someone's yard. And how empty and meaningless and hopeless Christmas is when you don't know who Jesus is. I'm gonna ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And would you just for a moment, let me ask you, do you wanna know the one who offers you all that? Do you wanna know the one who has no equal? Do you wanna know the one who was born to the Virgin Mary? Do you wanna know the one who lived a sinless life, who died a substitutionary death in your place, who rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? who promises to uphold you, your very existence, so that on the day he returns, you will escape the wrath and damnation and judgment to come, and you will be declared guiltless in the sight of God. Do you want to know this one? Oh, I pray that if you don't, you will. Father in heaven, move in the hearts of people that this Christmas may be the greatest, most glorious Christmas that they've ever had. In Jesus' name, amen.